Last week, we began looking at what Joe Biden's agenda on immigration may be and how successful he might be in cleaning up after the Trump administration. This is the second in a two-part video series addressing what we might expect from a Biden administration addressing all the problems in immigration law that Trump has created. My name is William Kovach and I am a trained immigration lawyer. I've often been disappointed in the way immigration issues are talked about in the media, although it's not always their fault. Immigration law can be a very complex subject, touching upon constitutional issues as well as personal political points of view. My goal is to explain immigration law to you, concentrating on looking at judicial opinions and executive actions in order to explain how immigration law can have an impact on our community and on our country. I hope that you'll join me as we try to make sense of immigration law and how it may affect the average person. So let's talk about Donald Trump's Muslim travel ban. Back in 2016, when Donald Trump was running for president, he made a promise to his followers that he would ban Muslims from coming into the country. This was based on his belief that Islam was equated with terrorism. And unfortunately, way too many people agreed with Donald Trump, and this became one of the biggest goals of his administration, and something that he tried to implement within the first 100 days of his administration. Now the thing is, his cronies understood immigration law, and because of that, they crafted this Muslim travel ban in a very clever way. They made it more about national security than about Islam. And as proof of that, the ban didn't cover just Muslim countries. They covered countries that were considered threats to the United States security, countries like North Korea. Also, it didn't cover all Muslim countries. It only covered countries that the United States had already identified as being a threat to national security. Countries like Sudan, Somalia, Syria, and Yemen. And moreover, the Trump administration made this about information in order to vet people who wanted to come to the United States. People were being banned from these countries because these countries were not able to provide the United States with sufficient information to determine if they were national security risks. So when the travel ban made it to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court sided with the president. Essentially, the Supreme Court said that when you're talking about actions that occur outside of the United States border, actions that the president believes are necessary to protect national security, that the president has broad discretion to engage in such activities. And that broad discretion extended itself to making a determination of who can be allowed into the country and who can be forbidden based on national security grounds. Now, while the Supreme Court decision may have been unpopular in many circles, the fact is the decision was very much consistent with a long line of cases that the Supreme Court has previously decided that dealt with foreign policy. That is, it's a well-settled point that when the president is acting outside of the United States borders and he's acting in a way to protect national security, when he's engaging in foreign policy, he has broad discretionary powers. But that also means that whatever Donald Trump has created by presidential proclamation, Joe Biden can undo by presidential proclamation. All he has to do is make similar findings of, well, national security is now settled, we're going to rescind the travel ban. But that raises a more important question, and that is, is this going to take a lot of political capital? Is this going to be a popular move? As I said, the ban covers more than just Muslim countries. It covers countries like North Korea. And it didn't cover all Muslim countries. It covered a very select few. It covered countries that the United States had already determined were dangerous. 
So politically, it may not be as easy to end the travel ban as we may like. And that's because by ending the travel ban, it will subject Joe Biden to being portrayed as being weak on national security. And that's something that Joe Biden will not want to be portrayed as. So I believe that we can look to Joe Biden softening the travel ban, but I don't think we're going to see it completely eliminated overnight. So now let's move on and talk about DACA, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. Let's briefly talk about what DACA is and then what I believe a Joe Biden administration can do. DACA was a program created by Barack Obama. The idea is that we had a number of people who were in the United States who were undocumented, but who came here as children. They were brought here by their parents. So they didn't have a choice in the matter. And what makes matters worse, they grew up understanding that America was their home country. This is their country for all intents and purposes, except legally. And this garners a lot of sympathy for your average person. But under the Obama administration, we just couldn't get a bill passed to legalize the status of all of these children who were brought here. Now, there was legislation, it was called the DREAM Act, the Development Relief and Education for Alien Minors Act, and those who were covered were called DREAMers. It would have created a legal status for those undocumented aliens who were brought here as children when they had no say in the matter and who grew up essentially believing America was their home country. It would have opened a lot of doors, for example, to be able to pursue education and employment opportunities that otherwise were foreclosed to them. But because the Tea Party took a very hard stance against common sense immigration reform, it never passed Congress. The Tea Party essentially labeled this as amnesty, and anything that's labeled as amnesty, according to the Tea Party, is bad. And so they exerted pressure on Republicans in Congress not to pass the DREAM Act, because if they did, the Republicans were going to get a challenge in the primary. And so that frightened a number of Republicans away from supporting this legislation. Barack Obama believed that he had no choice but to move forward with executive action. And he used a power that he has. It's called deferred action. Now, what is deferred action? Deferred action is essentially a promise. It's just a promise. We're not going to try to deport you. And the statute, the only place where deferred action is actually mentioned in the statute, the statute gives the president the ability to grant work authorization on a discretionary basis to those who have been given deferred action. So President Obama used this power and he created out of whole cloth a whole new program with its own criteria and its own rules. That was DACA. DACA gave the people who qualified, people who were brought here between a certain period of time, who were a certain age, and as long as they were pursuing education or had a job or were going into a military, they were given deferred action. And I know what I'm about to say is not going to be popular, particularly among immigration advocates. DACA is very likely unconstitutional. Why? It's a broad program that the president created whole cloth. In a sense, he acted as the legislature trying to create law. He violated separation of powers. And in the past, when deferred action was used, it was either used on an individual basis, a case-by-case -case basis for those cases that were sympathetic enough to end removal proceedings, or it was used on a small-scale basis. For example, when we had temporary protected status for people from Liberia during the Liberian Civil War, that lasted for around 20 years. 20 years, people had TPS, then all of a sudden, when there was a new president of Liberia, there was a move to end TPS for Liberians. Well, what the president did was grant deferred action for a period of like a year or so in order to allow those Liberians who had been in the country for a good 20 years to make better preparations for returning home to Liberia. 
but this was the first time that deferred action was being used to create a whole new program with all new qualification requirements that was going to affect millions of people. And while the Supreme Court addressed DACA, the Supreme Court has never found DACA to be constitutional. What the Supreme Court found is when President Trump tried to end DACA, that he did so in violation of the Administrative Procedures Act. Essentially, he did so without giving reasonable consideration to the consequences of what he was doing. The ending of DACA, for example, did not consider both the fact that it was a protection against deportation as well as being a grant of work authorization. Moreover, the Supreme Court said that the Trump administration should have considered the hardship that ending DACA would have on those people who were relying on it in order to have the legal right to work. But the Supreme Court did not say that DACA was constitutional. Now, the easiest thing for Joe Biden to do is simply to continue DACA based on executive action. There's probably going to be a lot of support for that, and mostly because members of Congress don't have to go on record as voting for it. So of course, hey, let Joe Biden take the heat for continuing it. We do like the program. We're going to let it continue. But let's be clear, that is not in the best interest of the Dreamers. The continuation of DACA is not in the best interest of the Dreamers. And it's for a very simple reason. DACA does not confer legal immigration status. DACA is merely a promise not to seek deportation. That's it. In order to get legal status and a pathway to either permanent residency or citizenship, there has to be a law passed. The legislature has to act. Congress has to act. So that raises the question. Could the DREAM Act be resurrected, maybe expanded to include more aliens who were brought here as children, and could it pass Congress? Well, on one hand, we have the problem of the U.S. Senate, and that is, as of the time that we're recording this, the Democrats only have 48 seats in the Senate, and that means they can't muster a majority to pass their legislative agenda. They would have to win both of the Georgia Senate seats that are up for a special election on January 5th. Then they would have to rely on a Vice President Kamala Harris on breaking a tie, a 50-50 tie. And the chances of the Democrats winning both seats in Georgia? Well, winning one seat I think they have a pretty good shot at, but as of right now, the other seat? It's really a crapshoot. But that being said, the DREAM Act was really a popular act. DACA is really a popular program. There are a good number of Republicans who support DACA or the DREAM Act. Now, it may take some political capital on Joe Biden's part, but passing a version of the DREAM Act may actually be possible, even if the Democrats don't win both of the seats in Georgia. Now, there's going to be a huge obstacle. That obstacle is Mitch McConnell. And to be quite frank, if the Republicans continue to control the Senate, Mitch McConnell's strategy is just going to be to do nothing, just like he did in an Obama administration. Do nothing, block everything that Joe Biden tries to do, because, well, the way that's going to play in middle America is, oh, look at how absolutely ineffective Joe Biden is, since he will be the focus of attention. Moreover, as I said, this is going to create a buzz among the Tea Party types because they're going to see it as amnesty. So the best case scenario is for the Democrats to win both of the seats in Georgia and then try to pass the DREAM Act, but it's not out of the realm of possibility that they could still pass the DREAM Act even if the Democrats don't win both of the seats in Georgia. Okay. Now let's talk about a pathway to citizenship for undocumented aliens who are present in the United States. Joe Biden is already on record as saying that in the first 100 days of his administration, he's going to submit a bill to the Senate to try to create a pathway to citizenship for undocumented aliens who are present in the United States. This will give such aliens a chance to make their status legal maybe become permanent residents, and then maybe even become citizens. And things like this have been done before, particularly during the Reagan administration. 
In fact, during the Reagan administration, what they set up was a program that had a high application fee. And that high application fee was to serve as sort of a fine for being present in the United States illegally. You paid the fee, the high fee, then you paid the rest of the regular fees, and then the government would process your application. If you qualified, you could become a permanent resident on your way to becoming a citizen. We don't know the exact makeup of what President-elect Biden has in mind. We don't have a text. We don't know what it's going to involve. So a lot of talk about this is speculation or educated guesses. What I want to talk about is the feasibility of passing something like this politically. First, this is going to be highly dependent on the political makeup of Congress. The Democrats control the House of Representatives. Right now, they have a 13-vote majority. There's still, what, one or two seats that are still pending. The Democrats are going to still have, though, a majority in the House of Representatives. But as we discussed when we talked about DACA, it's a completely different question with respect to the Senate. There are two Senate seats that are outstanding. Both of those seats are in Georgia. They are subject to a runoff election that's going to take place on January 5th. The Democrats need to win both seats to win control of the Senate. Even then, it will be a 50-50 split, and it will be up to a Vice President Kamala Harris to break the tie. That is the only hope for passing a pathway to citizenship, is if the Democrats win both seats in Georgia. Even then, I'm going to tell you, this is going to be a difficult sell. Why? Because the Tea Party types are going to consider this amnesty. It is going to be the amnesty buzzword that motivates them to go and oppose this with every fiber of their being. In fact, I'm hearing immigration professionals already referring to this as Biden's amnesty. I really wish you would all stop it. I want you to stop it because you're flagging this for the Tea Party types already. You call it amnesty, they're going to be motivated to go out there and oppose it even if the Democrats control Congress. It's going to make it harder to pass. So stop it. Stop calling it an amnesty. We don't even know what it looks like right now. The thing is, conservative Democrats are going to be hard-pressed to try to support a pathway to citizenship. It's going to take a large expenditure of Biden's political capital to twist arms to make sure the pathway to citizenship passes. And even if everything goes the Democrats' way, even if they win both seats in Georgia, even if Joe Biden can twist arms, there's still only going to be a very small window of opportunity. And that's because there's no guarantee that the Democrats are going to remain in control of Congress after the 2022 midterm elections. Historically, midterm elections mean that the president's party loses seats in both houses of Congress. Now, if the historical trends continue, then that means that there's a decent chance that the Democrats will lose control of Congress in 2022. What that means is that there's just this very short window within Biden's first term, the first two years of Biden's first term. That is going to be the only window of opportunity to pass this pathway of citizenship. If it's going to happen, it needs to have a strong push and it needs to have a strong push immediately. Okay, so we've reached the end of part two and here's the bottom line. Whether we'd like to admit it or not, Biden's going to have a tough road to haul with respect to immigration reform. Now, real immigration reform is going to require political change. We're going to need Democrats voted into the Congress. In particular, more Democrats voted into the Senate. Then we have to deal with the political reality of the midterm elections in 2022. In my assessment, unless Joe Biden happens to reign over an incredible turnaround of the economy before the first midterm elections, I think we may have to wait yet again until maybe the 2024 elections for there to be widespread true immigration reform. 
For one thing, that's going to give the state legislators a chance to address redistricting after the census. And one of the problems the Democrats are going to face is that there are still in districts that were drawn by Republicans to create safe Republican districts. Those districts have to be redrawn to give the Democrats a chance to continue with their majority in the House. But the fact remains, unless the Democrats make a real push to win more seats in the Senate, immigration reform is just going to continue to be a difficult goal for us to achieve. Certainly, Joe Biden is going to be able to do certain things on his own with his own executive authority. But as far as comprehensive immigration reform, that is only going to be possible if we have a greater push to elect more Democrats to Congress. Thank you for watching. Please remember to like and subscribe. If there are any topics you would like me to address in the future, please let me know in the comments below. Now, I don't like talking about this, but I am currently disabled because of complications following cancer surgery. If you're feeling generous, I'll have a link to my PayPal account in the description below. Thank you.